Welcome everybody to today's webinar on oak decline. I'd like to thank everyone for registering and for your interest in your oak trees in your communities. Today we have representatives from various agencies, including Urban Forest Management, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and Virginia Department of Forestry. We also have three elected officials, Senator Surville, Delegate Kryzak, and Supervisor Stork. So I will give them a uh, chance to briefly talk before we start our presentation. So Senator Surville, you have the floor. Great, thank you. And, and first of all, I wanna thank you for making yourselves available so that all the people in our community can gain the benefit of all the knowledge you all have about trees in our, in our community and what we can do to help save them. I'm, I'm not in purgatory, I'm actually in my car. I pulled off in a parking lot on the way home tonight so I could talk really quick. Just to give everybody some perspective about, about what caused me to ask you all to make this presentation. My, my grandparents moved to Fairfax County in 1936 and they moved to the house that I live in in 1941. And back then it was a wooded neighborhood. Since then it's become a much more wooded neighborhood. And I grew, it's the neighborhood I grew up in, two doors up the street from my grandparents' house and the house I now, grew up, I now live in. And in the 51 years I've lived in Northern Virginia, I have not seen nearly as many dead oak trees around my community as I have my entire life. And I feel like it's a problem that we're seeing now and I feel like it's accelerating. My father lost a tree in his front yard, the house I, the house I lived up the street in. I went out and counted the rings in it. There's 140 rings in it. I lost one in my yard uh, last year that had 120 rings in it. My neighbor has two or three across the street that are dead. If you walk to the Holland Hall Safeway on Fort Hunt Road and you just look out, you will see six or seven dead oak trees. If you drive down JW Parkway, there's dead oak trees. You can count them as you drive down the road. There's clearly something going on in our environment, in our ecology. There's a lot of different reasons for it between the age of the forest and between what's going on with our environment but talk to a lot of people and there's a lot of people concerned. People feel, get very attached to the trees that are in their yard. They want, they want to preserve them and save them. There's a lot of different reasons that are good for that. And I think you all have a lot of good information that people could benefit from so we could all learn how to help save the trees that are in, in our neighborhood, in our community, so that we can continue to have the, the sort of quality of life and protection and the environment that we all expect to have in our community, notwithstanding what's going on with climate change. And so I just appreciate the time you all are gonna to take tonight to show us all this stuff. And I hope everybody gets to learn something tonight. And also wanna thank Delegate Krizak and Supervisor Stork for, for co-sponsoring this and helping pulling together all of our state and uh, local assets to better educate our community about what I think is an emerging problem. So thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Senator Surval. This is Delegate Paul Krizak, and I represent the 16th District, the old 44th District, but that's most of Mount Vernon uh, north of Fort Belvoir. And uh, like Senator Surval, and I want to first of all, I want to acknowledge that it was his idea to have this this meeting, and to thank him and my colleague uh, uh, Supervisor Stork as well for putting this together. Like him, I want to say that it's a concern. I actually live on White Oaks Drive. And so you can imagine if we lose the oak, white oaks, and I've got a few in my yard, and you know, white oaks can live three to 600 years, um, you know, with in ideal conditions. So uh, it, it does, I'm, I'm sure like many of you, it breaks my heart to think uh, that they are all gonna be wiped out. I mean, imagine a community with no acorns, you know, a tree has, to, I think a white oak has to be about 25 years old and then it starts producing acorns, but that changes the whole, uh, the ecology, you know, uh, there's squirrels and deer and everything that eat the acorns and all kinds of birds that uh, and squirrels that live in the tree. We 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 um, there's so many uh, different kinds of oaks too. We've got willow oaks and red oaks and and all uh, you know scrub oaks and things like that. So if there's a way we can prevent or 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 mitigate against losing these oaks, we need to do everything. It needs to be all hands on deck, and and that's why I'm glad we're doing this and we're going to hear from. Uh, folks from the Virginia Cooperative Extension, the Fairfax County Forestry Department, and the State Forestry Department, and I appreciate all of their expertise, and I hope we all learn uh, what we can do tonight. So thank you all, everybody, for being concerned as well and for joining us. And I want to start by thanking uh, Senator Sovell really for just highlighting what we all, I think, have kind of uh, 
recognized, but maybe didn't ever put all the pieces together. But at least from my perspective, that was the case. I have a, a beautiful pin oaks in my in my yard, and then at the after the government center, we have a number of um, just beautiful oaks, and, and they tend to still be doing well. But I realize it's not true in some locations that that uh, Senator Silva mentioned. Delegate Krizak, you know, clearly the three of us have a passion for the, the outdoors and nature and the environment. We all three have been deeply involved with protecting all of those, and and recognize that that's an essential part of why we're here and, and what we deeply care about in terms of our responsibility, not just for today and tomorrow, but for the next generations that are coming, are coming after us to make sure that we've left them a place that, that frankly honors our planet and honors our history. And we all know that that's, um, we're not doing too well on a lot of those pieces right now and, and recognize that we have to step up and do more. And, and that's clearly what, I mean, the beauty of what we've got today is that elected officials that are deeply committed to that. And we've got a uh, great, great interest in this. The, the, the turnout today, more than 700 folks have registered and that's just phenomenal. I don't, I've never been at an online meeting at least that had anything close to that. So I'm looking forward to, to learning as much as I know all of you are uh, about uh, what's going on and how we can make a difference, how we personally can make a difference and protect uh, the, the mighty oaks. Number of people I wanted to make sure are thanked, and I may miss a couple, so uh, please uh, intervene and add to whoever I have, I have not properly thanked. But thank you to start with the county staff. I want to, to thank them, Tina DiMarino, the urban forester too, for the Fairfax County Urban Forestry Management Division for coordinating and communicating with staff to advertise the event, as well as helping facilitate the webinar. Um, Adrian Bordas, uh, Fairfax County Unit Coordinator and Extension Agent with the Fairfax. I'm sorry, with the Virginia Cooperative Extension for providing the Zoom platform for the webinar. She also helped with the content of the webinar and, and is helping to facilitate the webinar. Um, Joan Allen, the Foreign Pest Branch Chief for Fairfax County Urban Forest Management Division for moderating the webinar. Thank you also to the Mount Vernon Tree Commissioner, our fairly new tree commissioner, Elaine Kolish, for her advocacy to present this important topic and for her coordination in making this meeting happen. In case you don't know, Fairfax County has a tree commission. Um, Elaine is our representative um, and she is really a key part of how we can connect and make a difference. I'd also like to now introduce tonight's presenters. Uh, we have Catherine Layton, who's the Urban Forestry Two, Forester Two for Ferris County Urban Forest uh, Management Division. She's gonna be presenting a brief history of the forest in Fairfax County. We have Patrick O'Brien, also an Urban Forester Two, Ferris County. Uh, presenting uh, Why Are My Oaks Dying So Suddenly? Uh, additionally, we have Jim McGlone, urban forest uh, conservationist with the Virginia Department of Forestry. His primary contact is for City of Alexandria, Falls Church, Fairfax, as well as Arlington and Fairfax County. He'll be presenting What Can I Do to Help My Oaks? Uh, those are a sampling. I, if I missed one or two, I'm sure the, the presenters can fill in, but we are deeply thankful that they're here and can help us all make a difference. So with that, please take it away. Thank you, Supervisor Stork and all the other elected officials for coming today. I'd like to present to you Ms. Catherine Layton, who will be doing our first presentation. Hi, everybody. And I just want to say we do love our oak trees. It was just very well put by our representatives earlier, but for the longest time, people have loved their trees and everything that they provide for us. And that's why we're here tonight. And so to best understand where we are today, it's a good idea to first understand how we got here. So let's take a little step back in time. Um, maybe not that big a step, but it is worth remembering that the tree canopy where we live has changed a lot over the centuries. So to get a historical perspective, let's go back to when Fairfax County Forest was before European colonization. It was predominantly oak hickory with other mixed hardwoods and pine and cedar. American chestnuts dominated the hills to the west. And the forest was burned by natural fires and by people who moved their villages periodically to fresh, rich soil and hunting grounds. Post colonization, for the first time, permanent land ownership 
was the way permanent farms were made. The importation of European plants and livestock like cattle, hogs, sheep, apples, peaches, pears, grapes, plums, and a lot more uh, happened. And the regular burning of forested areas followed by forest regeneration pretty much ceased. Here's a Great Falls area in 1937. And these are the oldest aerial photos that the county has. And they are available for anybody to view. These historical aerial photos of the county are available on the Jade platform. That's Jade, J-A-D-E. Uh, it's open to the public and user friendly. This is the same area today. The oak forest is now quite fragmented. It's kind of hard to even recognize it anymore. Here's a chatbot question for you guys. Which do you think is the decade that saw the most development in Fairfax County? Yeah, 1980s. It continued on into the 90s a little bit, but the 1980s was a, pretty much an explosion of development that we see. So just to show you, this is Great Falls in 1980. And the next slide, Great Falls in 1990. What happened? Basically, post-World War II baby boomers grew up and needed homes, and people moved to the DC suburbs for jobs. Now, I zoomed in on a, one particular area because it's got some what we call wolf trees, that is uh, oak trees that grew out in the open uh, so they could spread out completely as well as a wooded area on the right. And we can watch them through the development process and see you know, how it all came about in that one spot. So you see the two wolf oaks are circled in pink and they are still there up to 19, 43 and then some, and I think there's still in 1953, my pink kind of covered it up a little bit, but somewhere between 53 and 76, the road was paved and telephone poles went up with guy wires to hold those up. And that tree had to come out, I guess. Uh, in any case, it disappeared. In the wood lot, you see the same trees through that whole period. It kind of looks like whatever the farm was in the midst of those trees on the other side of Springvale Road kind of looks like mm, it stopped functioning, sort of. It looks like it was people moved away. So what happened next? Our wolf tree is still there. It's a big white oak, by the way, and it's absolutely splendid today. As you look at the woodlot, you see the development. New road came in, houses built. The church was built and there is somewhat fragmented woods left where all those houses went up. And that uh, oak tree is still there. It's now over a hundred years old. Now here's a question for you. What was the biggest agricultural farming in Fairfax in the 40s and 50s? Do you think it was fruit orchards, beef, vegetables, dairy, or hay? Fairfax, which is the most populous county in Virginia, once had the largest number of dairy farms, more than 200 in the 50s in the Commonwealth. The Alexandria Dairy became the most modern dairy in the area. They were the first ones to use squared bottles so that they could be packed into refrigeration trucks that they now had and had established a fleet of 80 refrigerated delivery trucks so that they could take them to all the um, stores in Fairfax County and beyond. So here's Mount Vernon area in 1953. Uh, you can already see visible development. As we said, refrigeration allowed the milk to be trucked in from far away and the va land values increased so that 
developers were buying it and it was uh, urbanizing. Now here we go today, highly de developed and the woodlots are the same trees. They remain in fragments, mainly along the streams and in older neighborhoods. So what other major event happened to oak trees in Fairfax in the late 80s through 95? This was really big for oaks. So the leading edge of and the spreading of the spongy moth, which was formerly the gypsy moth, moved through the county. This invasive caterpillar of European origins, favorite food is the oak trees of all species that are found in the county. That would be red oak, white oak, pin oak, willow oak. They were absolutely their favorites. In 1991, that was probably the biggest year of the battle against the spongy moth, the county sprayed over 35,000 acres of oak dominated urban forest that would otherwise have been 100% defoliated. This wasn't the county all by itself, but it was in cooperation with the US Forest Service and Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, VDAX. The caterpillars devoured oak leaves all of them basically, and the leaf clippings and frass, which is scientific for poo-poo, rain down on everything below. But the, the mess, as bad as it was, wasn't by far the worst. The county would not have gone to such great lengths to end it if it hadn't been that two to three years of consecutive defoliation would have killed the trees. And Fairfax County really cares about its urban tree canopy, whether it's in woodlots, in parks, or residential private property. Resources were poured into keeping the trees alive. To summarize what the history tells us, Fairfax County has a long history of unforested agriculture. The agricultural land went to residential and commercial uh, property use quickly. And the remnant oaks in Fairfax County are around 100 years old or more. The oak species that are common in the county have life expectancies from 100 to 400 years, depending on the species, but under the best conditions. And so keeping that all in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick, who will tell us all about uh, trees. Take it away, Patrick. Thank you, Catherine. Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick O'Brien, and I will be speaking about the stress factors that affect the health of oaks. So the majority of oaks we see every day are managing with some amount of stress. However, oaks with thinning crowns or that have a canopy full of brown leaves could be weakened to the point where they have depleted their carbohydrate reserves and are vulnerable to insects and diseases. I wanted to begin by looking at several examples of oaks that we've observed here in Fairfax. There's no pattern to where we find these oaks. They've been observed in various locations throughout the county, including suburban areas and parks. I believe these first three photos are examples of why residents are most concerned. They show examples of apparently healthy oaks suddenly turning brown. Taken Last year, this, this oak appears to have leafed out in the spring, only to have all of its leaves turn brown in September. This, this photo shows an oak with a canopy full of brown leaves standing out among other healthy trees. Another great example of an oak that probably didn't appear to have major issues in the spring, but then turned entirely brown in September. These next few photos are examples of gradual decline, likely over several years. These, this oak shows dieback in the upper canopy and live branches in the lower canopy. This oak is showing twig dieback and new sprouts along its limbs, giving the branches a bushy appearance. Portions of this oak canopy appear to have died at different times. Now it appears only the lower limbs have leaves. 
This view shows a thinning canopy and a patch of dense oak forest. The home, homeowner said the tree canopy used to shade their yard, but has recently started thinning. Dieback is visible at the end of the branches. Now there's more sunlight reaching the ground and saplings have started popping up. Lastly, this is a dead and leafless oak that may have failed to leaf out in the spring. So let's start off by talking about what, it is not, what is not responsible for killing oaks in Fairfax. Sudden oak death in oak wilt disease. Sudden oak death is a water mold pathogen that causes dead section of bark called cankers that often have seeping black or reddish ooze. Also, there are leaf spots and twig dieback. Oak wilt is a fungal disease that causes sudden wilting, especially in the red oak group, early leaf drop, discolored leaves, and sometimes vascular streaking in the sapwood. A stressed oak, like the examples we just looked at, could exhibit symptoms that remember, resemble these diseases, like sudden browning of the canopy. But there are currently no lab-confirmed cases of either disease in Virginia. Naturally, the question is, what is killing my oaks? Unfortunately, most of the time, there is no clear explanation for why an oak died or what is responsible. But this slide attempts to show some of the stresses that affect the health of oak trees. It's a host of stress factors that interact to weaken oaks over time. The oak may exhibit gradual signs of decline over several years, or appear to suddenly die when its resources have been exhausted. However, it's not possible to point to a single stressor on this slide and say it was the main reason why an oak died. Tree death is the result of a combination of interacting stresses over years or decades. These outbreaks of dying oaks are called oak decline which is the gradual decline in health that results from predisposing, inciting, and contributing stress factors. Oak decline occurs over a period of years or decades, ending in the death of vulnerable oaks. The occurrence of oak decline can vary from a few trees in an urban forest to several thousand oaks in large forested areas. I will further discuss these three groups of stress factors in the following slides. When you look at an oak tree in its current environment, whether it's your yard, roadside, or park, it's impossible to know the entire history of that specific tree. Many of the mature oaks in Fairfax have been through the major events Catherine discussed in her presentation. Those land cover changes Catherine talked about, going back to when Fairfax had the most dairy farms in Virginia up to the present, have had a lasting impact on tree health. Those trees are now in the 70 to 90 plus age range and have even less capacity to tolerate stresses. This is an aerial photograph from 1937 of the Fair Lakes area. The yellow lines overlaid on the aerial depict today's roads and its commercial and residential development that took off in the 1980s. This illustrates how the oaks and Fairfax have, that have been around since the early 1900s have had to deal with the compounding stresses of agriculture then development. These predisposing factors, which include stand history, tree age, soil conditions, and competition, all affect an oak's ability to compete for resources in the future and recover from stresses of inciting factors. So inciting factors, are short-term, discrete events that add further stresses to oaks, initiating their decline. These stressors include early season damage to foliage, such as a windstorm or hailstorm, insect defoliation, such as spongy moth, late spring frost, and drought. Stresses may be more frequent and severe in urban forests, where trees often experience disturbances associated with construction and heat island effects. During drought, defoliation, or injury, a tree must use its stored food reserves to recover. Recovery from a prolonged drought is a significant strain on the tree's carbohydrate reserves, which can affect the tree as many as 10 years after the event. 
This could leave them weakened and vulnerable to insect attack. Secondary insects and diseases are contributing factors that cause further stress and damage to trees. They include Armorelia root rot, hypoxylin canker, two-line chestnut borer, and ambrosia beetles. Normally, these insects and diseases are present in the environment and are not a threat to trees. They take advantage of stressed trees, but by themselves cannot initiate oak decline. These factors are often blamed as a cause of death because they seem to appear just before or after the tree has died. When contributing factors are present in oak trees, they are a sign of advanced decline and considered the last nail in the coffin. The first indications of oak decline are visible in the upper canopy of the tree. Dieback begins from the tips of the branches and progresses inward and downward. Branches can die during the growing season, sometimes leaving a canopy of brown leaves, but typically branches will fail to leaf out in the spring. Eventually, larger branch and limb dieback will occur over several years or even decades. Other accompanying symptoms include chlorotic leaves, sparse foliage, and new sprouts along the trunk and limbs called epicormic sprouts, as shown in the middle photo. To summarize, oak decline is a combination of predisposing and citing and contributing factors. These factors can cons vary considerably from one area to another. Generally, here in Fairfax, some oaks are more vulnerable to oak decline due to their advanced age and history, which makes them more susceptible to inciting factors and vulnerable to insects and diseases. Feel for additional information, feel free to contact our office by phone or email. Speaking next will be Jim McGlone to tell you what you can do to help your oaks. And just to recap, what we've heard so far is Catherine talked about the development of the urban forest in Fairfax County. From my perspective, we are in a recovery period from a big timber boom we had at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. And so most of the forest land has started to regrow as forest and is going through that process. So we're facing a pretty even aged forest. Over that time period, since the about 1930 on, what we have seen is a continued increase in the amount of wood fiber per acre in our forest, which is increasing competition, but also those trees are starting to reach middle age. And when they do that, we start to see this process we call oak decline syndrome. I prefer to call it multiple stress disorder. And as Patrick pointed out, this can be various stressors. Getting old is a stressor. Competition with other trees is a stressor. Drought, flooding, cold weather, unusually cold weather, defoliation, these are all events that cause stress on trees. And as the tree develops more and more stress, they become less able to resist endemic, what we call secondary pests and pathogens. Uh, things like armillaria root rot, hypoxylin canker, ambrosia beetles, two-line two chestnut borers. These are all native fungi and insects and a healthy tree gets rid or or sheds them doesn't it doesn't respond to them it's sort of like the cold virus in humans we're surrounded by adenovirus all the time that's what causes colds but we only get colds when we get stressed and run down and our immune system can't fight off those viruses and the same thing is happening with our oaks and then of course if you get a uh, cold and you try to power through it, you're gonna be more susceptible to things like flu, which then can become pneumonia and eventually lead to death. And that's the same process we're seeing, not just in oaks, but we do see it in pretty much all species of trees. This is the way trees die. They get old and then they become susceptible to these native secondary processes. So what can you do about oak decline? Well. One simple thing is watering. Remember that drought is a stressor, not just on trees, but on all plants. 
But keep in mind, flooding, which can be overwatering, is also a stressor. So you have to be careful and not overwater the trees. The trees in the Mid-Atlantic and here in Fairfax County are adapted to our current water regime. And our normal southern summer weather is highs in the, in the upper 80s and low 90s. But we do get about two inches of rain, two to two and a half inches of rain in July and August. That's natural. And it does, uh, the difference is it tends to come in large downpours rather than slow, gentle rain that comes over the course of the whole day. So what you should do if you want to water your trees, and I do not water my trees, even in 2019 when we had definite stress or drought conditions, I didn't water. Use a soaker hose, water it, put it in a spiral around the tree, turn the tap on about one quarter turn and let it run overnight. So you're getting a slow trickle of water into the soil where it can spread out and move through the soil column and wet down the entire soil column. But you should also be using a soil moisture meter because you don't want to start doing this and give this kind of deep watering until the soil is dry down to about three inches deep. Don't respond to just that surface layer. Now, a better thing to do is what I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation talking about it. And the, because this is going to relieve year round stress, not just stresses that occur during drought. And that is turf. Turf likes warm, dry, bacterially dominated soils. Trees like cool, moist, fungally dominated soils, polar opposites of each other. Trees and turf are fighting with each other to create the conditions in, their, in the tree's root zone that the tree likes. The Morton Arboretum did a study or sponsored studies symposium several years ago. And what they found was, what they reported was, you get five times more tree root mass under mulch than you do under turf. And a lot of this is because turf tends to restrict the infiltration of water and oxygen into the soil below its root zone. That's why we can cut it into squares and roll it up and sell it the way we do. So the thing that a homeowner can do, very simple thing the homeowner can do by themselves, is to pull that turf back and mulch the tree with either green or brown mulch. And I'll explain that, those two things in a bit. So we know we're getting five times more tree root mass under the mulch. And the question I always get is, well, how far away from the tree should we mulch? Well, to answer that, this is what a tree aspires to. And notice that the root system extends well beyond the drip line of the tree. I have not seen any studies that say this is how far to mulch, just that where you mulch, you're going to have a better tree root system. So my answer to this question is, that I always give is you should mulch to the property line. And if you can get your neighbor to agree, mulch beyond the property line. If you can't stand to give up all of your turf for your trees, then mulch as much as you can. So here's a good example of a pretty well mulched tree. This is a white oak in a community park in Northern Fauquier County. Notice that that ring of mulch extends pretty much out to the drip line and they have a thin layer, about two to three inches of wood chips that they've spread around under that tree. And wood chips actually are the best mulch for the tree, which is convenient because as you can see in the picture, they frequently are free. The arborists are looking for places to do it. But what that mulch is going to be doing, should be doing is it should be keeping your soil cool, it should be keeping your soil moist by reducing the amount of evaporation of soil moisture. And it should be seed, feeding your soil food web. And if you are using wood chips, you are going to be feeding those ectomycorrhizal fungi that are really important for oaks. This is the type of mycorrhizae that the oaks 
form symbiotic relationships with. So you get under a good organic mulch, you're going to get cool, moist, fungally dominated soils, which is what the trees like and what you find out in the forest. The other thing is you wanna make sure that your mulch is allowing gas exchange and helping to infiltrate water. This is why the wood chips are so much better than say bark mulches. The function of bark is to keep water inside the tree. So it is what we call hydrophobic. That is, it repels water. Whereas the function of wood is to move water around inside the tree. So it's hydrophilic. So it will absorb water. The other advantage there is when it rains on wood chips, they fill up with water and they stay in place, whereas bark will float away. However, not all wood mulch is the same. These green wood chips from the Arborist Company, there's actually an app called Chip Drop. I think it's Chip Drop app, but you, if you just look, search for Chip Drop, and that will put you in touch with Arborists who are looking for places to get rid of their, their wood chips. This, unfortunately, has become the landscaping standard, this really highly, finely ground mulch. And this is most of the way to becoming paper, because that's how we make paper, is we grind up wood really, really, really into really, really fine particles, and then we let plastic down on top of your trees. I try to encourage people not to do it, but for some reason, this has become the landscaping aesthetic. It's probably be because the big landscaping companies can actually put this stuff through a blower to, to put it out in the landscape rather than have to use wheelbarrows and pitchforks. But brown mulch is essentially organic mulch. Another great brown mulch is leaf litter. Just don't rake the leaves under, the, you know, establish that mulch bed and let the leaves lay on top of it. Green mulch is using preferably native shade tolerant plants underneath the tree. This is, you can see the big willow oak here. And then these plants that we have growing, because this is my yard, have growing under it are. They are part of that process that we're looking for with mulch, keeping the soil cool, increasing water infiltration. The brown here, these are actually the leaves from the last from last fall that we just leave to lay there. And then these plants all come up through them. Using green mulch, particularly if you're using native plants and shrubs, uh, not only has the benefit of helping your tree and reducing the stress on your tree, it also addresses the three big environmental crises that we are facing today. Climate change gets most of the press. And by converting from turf grass to layered native plants under your trees, you're going to get more cooling from more evapotranspiration from those plants and reduced emissions because you're not running that two cycle lawnmower over it every week, or even that electric motor. And those plants are gonna be sequestering more carbon than the turf will. The other two crises we're, we're facing are the insect apocalypse and the bird decline. There's been a lot of research that shows our native insects first of all, are declining at about 2% per year, which is a 63% decline over the past 50 years. But also they have a strong preference for our native plants. And this isn't just the caterpillars and other plant grazers. We're also getting a lot more information about the specialization of our native bees on native plants. About 30% of our locally native bees specialize on native plants. So by planting these native plants, reduce, reducing your turf area, you're providing a habitat for those insects. And we have also seen a 30% bird decline over the past, since 1970. And that decline is not just the kind of rare birds that not everybody sees all the time. That includes starlings and sparrows. 
And we now know that birds and insects are very closely related. And we have evidence that people planting native plants in their yards help support our bird and insect populations. So we can fight climate change, we can, we can help insects, we can help birds simply by pulling turf back, and we're also helping our trees at the same time. So how do you get rid of the turf? Well, the most straightforward method is what I call the long-handled shovel method. That is, I'm sure you've all seen uh, sod, and the idea is you take your turf and you try and turn it into sod by cutting in and then scalping off the grass, the turf, to remove it. Try and get the dirt out of the, the root zone. If you want, you can compost that, the turf that you pull up, and then once it starts to decompose and become compost, you can spread that around as a top dressing. Another popular way is what's called solarizing or smothering, where you spread cardboard or newspaper or plastic or maybe weed black or something like that over the turf, which prevents sunlight from getting in. And in some cases is also preventing carbon dioxide, or in all cases, actually, it's preventing carbon dioxide and uh, water from getting in there because all of these things that people use are water and vapor barriers. And what that means is you're not only smothering the grass, you are also harming your tree when you do it. And you've got to remove those barriers that you use for solarizing or smothering before you start planting or before you put down your wood chips. Because as they said, they become water and vapor barriers. They're gonna restrict the water going into the tree's root system, and they're going to restrict the oxygen that the tree's root system needs. Another way to solarize or smother is those arborist chips. And here I put six to eight because I know people are really, really resistant to this, but you can go to 10 or 12 inches on those arborist chips without creating a vapor barrier and without uh, reducing water infiltration. And what that will do is it will kill the grass. And then as those wood chips begin to decompose, they are going to be improving your soil, feeding that soil ecosystem. For your shrubs and woodies, you can actually just pull them, pull them apart and create a little bit of a hole and plant straight through that 12 inches of wood chips. If you're gonna do herbaceous, you're probably gonna have to remove some of those chips. The third, the final method is chemically. And the one thing you wanna be aware of is if you are using an herbicide, it has to be one that is not soil active. Glyphosate is probably the best. It only is effective if it's absorbed through the plant. As soon as it hits the uh, soil, it begins to break down. And so it's not going to be absorbed by your tree and uh, dose that way. So be sure if you're using a chemical, it's not a soil active herbicide. The best thing to do is read the directions. With glyphosate based herbicides, some of them you can plant 24 hours after you uh, apply the, the product. Others, it's three or four years afterwards and you don't wanna use those things. You want something that you can, that you can plant in right away. Finally, all right, unfortunately, I suspect a lot of you are tuning into this because your oak is dead or mostly dead. What are you going to do? Depends on how mostly dead it is. These things that I've suggested, pulling the turf back are is going to be helpful. You may need to engage a certified arborist to do some soil decompaction. They have a special tool called an air spade that they can actually fluff up and decompact the soil around the root system without doing a lot of damage to it, and then top dress it with some compost and wood chips to start getting that soil profile rebuilt. They can also treat with plant growth regulators. These were actually first invented for the the power company so they wouldn't have to prune their, the trees around power lines so often, but we discovered that it also 
tends to stimulate root growth and they use it uh, to pretty good effect out in the Midwest where they do have oak wilt, which is a specific fungal pathogen. And using these uh, plant growth regulators has done some to help those trees. But if you are, if your tree is completely dead, you want to plant another oak. And oaks have a reputation for being hard to transplant and expensive. But what we have found in the research is that if you are planting smaller stock, less than one and a half inch caliper, that's one and a half inches in diameter, six inches above the ground, a lot of those problems go away. If you've got room, plant in a group on say 10 foot center. So maybe three oaks that are in a triangle 10 feet apart. That gives you a bigger area to put, to put your green mulch in underneath or give it a good sized mulch ring when you plant it. If the tree is well planted and small and given room, those the oaks can grow pretty fast. The picture on the right here, that is a tree that, that's a northern red oak that was planted by a squirrel as an acorn in 2005. I took this picture in April of 2021. And that's a standard five gallon bucket at the base, just to give you some scale. So they can take off and grow pretty fast once they get their feet under them, if they're in a good site. And that all comes down to right tree and the right place. Do we have any questions, Anne? We have a question about uh, triclopore. Is that soil active? You mentioned that Roundup is not soil active. Right. So the, so the question is, is um, triclopore? Triclopore, my recollection is, if you read the product label, they recommend against planting on a site that you've treated with it for two years. So I think it does remain somewhat active in the soil and probably would not be the best solution for that okay. if you're spraying under a tree. Thank you. And there was another question about the name of the application for the tree chip mulch. Uh, chip drop. Okay, great. Now keep Thank in you. mind, they're usually going to want to bring you a whole truckload of chips. So be sure you need a lot of chips when you, uh, if you go that route. Or share them with your neighbors. Or share them with your neighbors. Absolutely. So the question is about maple trees and whether maple trees will also experience the, some of the stressors that you're talking about with oaks and would they be benefited by a mulch application as you've outlined for oaks? Well, the short answer is yes, but they don't seem to be as susceptible as the oaks do. And some of the speculation is because of the different nature of the vessel elements. These are the, the actual cells within the tree that transport the water. In oak, oaks are what are called uh, ring porous trees. So in the spring, they produce a lot of really big vessel elements. Sometimes you can see them, you know, if you look at a piece of oak firewood, you can sometimes actually see those vessel elements. And then they produce really little ones. And so what I have seen with some trees is they will leaf out in the spring. And this happened a lot in 2019. They leafed out in the spring, they look perfectly healthy. And then in late August, all of a sudden, all the leaves turn brown. The only explanation I have is catastrophic hydraulic failure, which means they got bubbles in all of those vessel elements that prevented water from getting up to the canopy. Maples produce very small vessel elements, and so it's easier to restore them if they get a bubble in them and they are less likely to snap than those big ones. So there's some differences in the physiology, but the process is there. And if we get enough stress, they will succumb. And I did see some, some maples and hickories that both uh, died in 2019 that way. 
So is there any way to prevent the water bubble failure? No. Uh, the trees have certain things in their physiology to help prevent the water bubbles, but a lot of it gets down to the size of the vessel element and what's happening. Watering during drought is one way to prevent that. The trees are relying primarily on osmotic pressure in the root system, that is water pushing in from the soils into the roots and then pushing water up through those vessel elements to the canopy, but also on uh, transpiration pull, which is water exiting through the leaves, water vapor going out through the leaves. So it's sort of like sucking on a straw, but there's also something down in the root system pushing on it. That's one of the reasons fertilization can be a problem because that can change the amount of dissolved solids in the soil water, which can reduce osmotic pressure. In addition, giving trees nitrogen when they're stressed is going to tell them to grow more canopy when they should be growing more roots. So I take it from that discussion that fertilization is not preferred, but mulching with an appropriate mulch like wood chips or the natural green mulch is a more beneficial for our trees. It is more beneficial. It works more with the uh, natural way that trees grow. The purpose of mulch is to imitate the forest floor, which is how trees always grow, is in a forest. And every year they get another layer of leaves and some dead wood and stuff laid down on top of the soil and it slowly decomposes and recycles all that stuff into the, the soil. But it's also helping keeping keep the moisture into in the soil and keep the soil cool. Great, thank you. And we have one question about bacterial leaf scorch. The question is if the there's an existing oak in this person's yard and not suffering from bacterial leaf scorch, should he avoid planting more oaks? Or what do you advise? I would say, no, we shouldn't avoid planting more oaks. Bacterial leaf scorch is exactly what it says. It's a bacteria. It is out there and endemic. You do want to, this is one case where you do want to rake leaves because pretty much the only thing we have right now to combat bacterial leaf scorch is what we call sanitation. So if it's a light infestation and you can get to it, you can prune it out but you also want to rake up the leaves because the bacterial spores overwinter in the leaf litter. So you do want to be careful if you replant note where one has died. Bacterial leaf scorch seems to be, or the, the red oak group, which would be black, scarlet, pin, willow, northern red, and southern red oak seem to be a, a bit more susceptible to bacterial leaf scorch. So you might want to switch to one of the white oak group species like uh, chestnut oak or, or white oak or post oak or swamp white oak or swamp chestnut oak. Those are the great. primary uh, white oak group in this area. Okay, great. That's, that's wonderful information. I know there is some information going around about nitrogen draft from using green wood uh, as a mulch, but that those studies were all done using SADA. The next couple slides are resources that are available to you if you'd like. So here we have our mo most popular uh, publication, our Tree Basics books, which goes over basic tree maintenance and tree planting and uh, does give some, some suggestions for different trees that you can plant on your property, depending on what type of, what features you would like. And so those are that is available online for free in English and various other uh, other languages. And you can also, if you would like some for your community, you can contact my office and we can give you uh, hard copies. If you're particularly interested in native plants, you can get this resource from Plant Nova Natives, not only for trees, but various other native plants that you can grow on your property. And Casey Trees has this really cool resource for a tree selection guide in very urbanized areas because 
trees are very an, an important resource in urban areas, but not all trees are suitable for urban areas. So you want to be very judicious about what trees you plant if you live in, in lots that are smaller and more urbanized. I think one of the biggest things or one thing that I would want our viewers to kind of go home with is if they notice their tree as it's getting more mature, what would what would we suggest someone to do to make sure that that, that oak tree or another hardwood large tree in their on their property to be taken care of and make sure that we can save the trees because of course replacing to an oak tree is going to take another hundred years to get to the size that we want that shade. I, I feel the most basic thing you can do is a little bit of TLC you can give them a little tender love and care. So you can do that by basic steps like mulching your trees. Mulching your trees is one of the best things you can do for your trees. Now that may sacrifice some of the turf you have growing around your trees. And unfortunately, turf and trees don't really agree. They're in competition with each other. I think that would be. So removing the turf around your trees could help the health of your trees. Also related is being very careful about disturbing the ground around your tree. So for those who aren't aware, trees roots are mostly found within the first two inches of soil. And so it's a lot of those fine roots that go out as far as they can into undisturbed areas. And disturbing that area with soil compaction, with maybe parking a car underneath a tree or having a lot of traffic underneath a tree, like foot traffic, I mean, digging a ditch around the critical root zone of a tree. Those are the type of things that can seriously affect the health of a tree. And finally, the last uh, one other simple tip is to be cognizant of watering. So if you know there's periods of drought and the soil looks really dry, you can do some watering around your trees. You don't want to go overboard because then you cause other problems. But if, you, if you've noticed that there's some periods of drought, you can, you can water your trees. And if you have any concerns about your trees, there are tree care professionals that are highly trained. You can hire a certified arborist who are normally employed through tree care companies, or you can also hire a consulting arborist who are usually independent consultants who get paid the same no matter what condition your tree is in. And they can give an assessment of whatever trees you would like a report for, and they can give you suggestions on how to better improve the health of the tree or if it's not in a good enough condition to, to improve its health. This is Delegate Krizak. Uh, can you talk a little bit about more about mulching? We've heard a lot of times that, that you can create a, uh, you can kill a tree by putting too much mulch around it. And also, the bigger, I think, question that many of us are concerned about is, is does this kind of mean that it's hopeless for the big oaks that are out there, or, or is it still okay to to plant new oaks and to hope and hope for the best for the big oaks, and is and talk to us about watering? Do you do like a drip uh, on the oak trees uh, during those extended drought periods? Is that the kind of best way? Okay, a lot of good questions. Thank you, delegate. First, I'll address the mulching. So yes, there is a phenomenon. And actually, I haven't seen this phenomenon nearly as much as I might have seen like 10 years ago. But there is something called volcano mulching, where people just piled just basically, it looked like they just took a wheelbarrow, and they just dump a bunch of mulch right up, up on the tree. And so you don't want that you want the basic guideline is three inches deep of mulch, and at least in a three foot diameter. But you can create as large of a mulch bed as you want. You're not restricted by three feet. So yes, there are guidelines and it's described in the Tree Basics booklet that I was talking about. That's one guidance for, for mulching. And then you had mentioned, is it hopeless for, for oaks? What if, Should people stop planting oaks? Should we just give up on them? And I say no. There, there are many different species of oaks. And so, and, and before I had mentioned maybe steering away from the more Northern associated oaks, that doesn't mean like, like a, a, a white oak or Northern red oak, that doesn't mean never to plant them, but maybe have a good mix. 
So I have some northern species and some southern species. And that's a general tip just whenever you do any kind of planting that you want to make sure you diversify the species and the genera or the type of trees that you have in your yard. So maybe you don't want all oaks or all hickories or all tulip poplars because if a pest comes or an issue comes that those trees are sensitive to or susceptible to, then you'll lose all your trees. But you want an, a nice healthy mix of everything. And one other point, and it's one that I, I makes me sad because I have many large oaks in my own yard, but all living things have a finite amount of time that they live. So we do, we do have some tree species that can live for hundreds and hundreds of years, but that's not the case for, for all oaks. There are some oaks that live up to 100, 150 years and, and that's it. And so many of the oak trees that we have, as Catherine pointed out, were planted long ago. And unfortunately, despite our best efforts, their, their life ends at some point. And so unfortunately that may come at the financial cost of the property owner which is, a, I've faced it myself, it's, it's a heavy, a heavy cost. And then you also asked about irrigation. So yes, there is drip irrigation that, Adria, actually, if you could speak more to irrigation, because you may have a, a better knowledge about the types of irrigation that people can do for, for trees, just in general. Yeah, some people will do drip irrigation or a soaker hose. I will will sometimes like to have just a slow drip from my hose and move it around the perimeter of the, the tree. And then that way you can water the entire root zone. You wanna make sure that you maybe either use a, your, your hand or a shovel, or you could use a screwdriver to see how compacted that soil is and if the water is actually penetrating in. That's really important to make sure that the water is getting into the root zone and not running off and, and going to another place. The other thing that I would really offer to some of this, as far as the health of our trees, is super important is the compaction is, you know, when you're when you have things under the tree, or if you're digging underneath a tree to plant other things like bulbs or other annual plants that also damages the roots. It may not damage it the first time or the second time, but after you've planted under that tree 50 times every season, there is going to be root damage and compaction. The other thing that I would suggest as well is to consider that oak trees love acid soil. And when we put uh, lime on our soil in order to increase the pH to grow better grass, you're competing, the grass is competing with the trees, the trees will always win. The grass is going to die out in July and you'll be struggling to grow that grass. So go with the trees. But I still have had people call our office, and I'm sure Joanne has had the same, where people want to thin their trees or prune their trees so that they have more sun to grow grass. The idea is that that those trees are going to really help to shade your house and really insulate your house. And I would also encourage people, you know, while we're talking about oaks tonight, and I know oaks are super important in our landscape, um, also other things that, that uh, I've noticed in the chat box and questions about county facilities are now using native plants that are being planted. If you see new county facilities that have been built, they have a large part of their landscape is native plants. And so that is something that the county has um, moved into as far as their own landscape and using themselves as a model, conservation landscaping and, and that native plants. But I think it's really important to remember that our soils are tough here, like the, the native um, clay soils. So improving the soil doesn't always just mean putting compost on the soil or, or lime, you might actually need to acidify the soil as well um, for some of the plants that require that acid soil. I hope that helps. Yeah, Adrian, this is Cervell. I'm now in my house. so Wonderful. Um, I appreciate all that information. And, you know, the um, one of my questions is like, when, once if you see any evidence that you have a tree that might be exhibiting some signs of stress, aside from perhaps, you know, drip irrigating it, 
or increase or getting rid of the grass under it or getting rid of some of the grass under it. I mean, one of the things Jim McGlone told me was that you just need to try to minimize lawn as much as possible if you're trying to save your oak trees. What, what about fertilization? I know my, my, my grandmother in my house 20 years ago had some companies that were telling her that she ought to fertilize their, their trees. And some of them sort of sprayed a ring around it, I remember. And then other times they went around with a pickaxe and dumped some 510.5 in a hole, or these little holes they put around it. And then they'd have big lumpy green grass growing out of that because the fertilizer was there. But I mean, is fertilization a realistic strategy to try to save a tree if it's showing any signs of stress in addition to water and minimizing grass? So that's a really good question. And a lot, I get that question a lot. People will ask, you know, if you want to fertilize a tree, often mature oaks are not going to, I don't think that fertilizer is really going to help a mature oak kind of if it's, if it's stressed out. I think that aerating the soil with, with air spade. So this is one thing that I think that we all need to understand, especially from Patrick's talk, that he talked about some of the factors that cause these problems. Some of the things that are kind of out of our control and I wish we had more control of is the weather. And our warm winters, our warmer winters have been stressing out our oak trees. And then we'll get a late frost or a late freeze in about April or May. And if our oak trees have already pushed out to leaves the size of a mouse ear, it will take five years, five years for that tree to recover from that one stressful event. Those are the things where if we cannot park under our tree, you know, your picnic table, set up a tent, don't put it under the tree, then you're going to have less compacted soil. What we can do to save our trees, really creating that zone or underneath of the tree that we're not going to really dig too much or play soccer or have a picnic table, you know, put up a canopy or a gazebo if you're going to have a picnic outside. It's really nice to sit under the trees, but understanding that maybe if you do have that picnic, maybe you have somebody come in and aerate the soil later on and yeah. to improve the soil because I know we're in your district at Mount Vernon probably the biggest challenge that they have is foot traffic on their older trees and I realize that you know their their budget's a little different than everyone else's when it comes to landscaping but they do a lot of aeration of their soil whether if it's grass or trees. All right Nadra I've also I think heard from professionals I've spoken to that if you're ever having any work done in your house it's absolutely critical to put up fences that the builders can't drive their trucks and cars and bulldozers around on. I, I, when I did some improvements to my house, I would come home and my temporary fences be moved and I would come out and scream at my contractor, don't touch the fences. I don't want you anywhere near the tree roots. They're only allowed to go here. And that, that's, I assume, true as well. If you're having an addition put on or whatever, you need to make sure you cordon off an area that they're not allowed to go anywhere close to if there's a tree near it because they might compact the roots and kill the tree. And, one or two or three years, you might not see it immediately, but it'll die eventually, right? That's right. That's right. And it's it, you're right on that critical root zone. And depending upon how large the tree is at the di diameter breast height, so um, depending on how many inches that is, that's going to determine how many that distance and that critical root zone that's needed to protect those roots. A lot of consulting arborists have uh, really talk a lot about those tree save zones, those critical root zones. And that's really important when anybody has work done on their house. Even if you think about it, if you have tree work done in your house, and I've had this done at my own house where I've had to tell the tree guys, don't ride too much over the roots on my beech tree over there when you're doing work on this tree over here. So even some of the folks that you think should know, we should still discuss that and have an open conversation. And being an educated homeowner, like we have all these folks joining us tonight is, is really gonna help a, a lot of those trees, um, you know, with their critical root zone. What are the questions you got? I, I, I saw an interesting one about deer browse and, and oak seedlings. So that, that is a, one issue that is because climate change isn't enough. Uh, so we have white-tailed deer who are very prevalent in the area and need something to eat and often go after native plants like oak seedlings. And so that is one challenge that we have 
in the area on the regeneration of not just oaks, but several other uh, tree species. And so the, the county does have a deer management program where they work on different properties to see if they can try to use trained folks, volunteers or professionals to try to reduce the pressures of, of our native uh, trees by culling some of the deer. But um, as folks were asking, how do you protect your trees from deer if you're planting a tree? And so we have some of those, you can protect at least from the rubbing if you were to put a tree, like the the things around the, the trunk of the tree, the name of it escapes me. Uh, some people have even fenced their properties to try to discourage deer from going in, but you'd have to have a pretty high fence. So it's very difficult to protect our future large oak trees from, from deer herbivory, but that is another issue that we have in the area. And since we had uh, quite a lot of mulch questions, uh, so there are many types of mulch that you can choose from. It's best to avoid the uh, double and triple shred hardwood mulch. That tends to pack. It doesn't let water and air in. It tends to form mold on top. So much better to look for hardwood chunky mulch and use that. And that'll be a lot better for your trees. And I see somebody wrote something um, about having a large white oak that suddenly died, but they left the trunk of two of the trees as snags for woodpeckers, owls, brown creepers, and, and they hung a bat house way up there. And I really like that comment. And um, I wanted to share an experience that I had in my own front yard where I had three large white oaks and fairly close together, but enough to be, you know, siblings, shall we say. We have to remember the trees grow in community. They all meet underground and the root systems interact. And so one of my white oaks, the one in the middle, started to decline very visibly. Branch by branch, the branches were dying. And I was going, oh no. And my first thought was, oh, it's some kind of disease. It's gonna get all three of them, but that never happened. I was afraid that there was something uh, in the trunk of the tree that it was going to fall. So that was my biggest fear because it's, it's a huge tree. It would have been disastrous. And so I had the arborist come to cut it down. And it turned out the trunk was absolutely fine. It was just brand, one branch at a time was dying. All I had to have done, if I had known, was have those particular branches pruned out. And the tree could have lived a little longer as it declined. But it was... In the long run, providing more nutrients and space for the two that were living. So I just wanted to say, keep it in mind the uh, the tree interactions. I think that there's a few questions about some of these ambrosia beetle. Joanne, when when you've seen ambrosia beetle and and I've been out in the field with you as well, what's your feeling on the ambrosia beetle when that shows up? Yeah, so unfortunately, we, we do see, again, a lot of reports about ambrosia beetles, both seen uh, reports from there on the extension and also from, from residents. And really, it's just, you know, that's the kind of the, the telltale sign that your tree's already been declining. And now we have ambrosia beetles kind of coming in and taking advantage of, of your weakened trees. And so usually if, if your tree is heavily infested with ambrosia beetles, which you, you can tell because they leave these very small exit holes on the bark of the tree. And sometimes you'll even see uh, frass or sawdust collecting at the base of the tree. Or if you're lucky, you'll see like a little, like almost like a protrusion of, of uh, sawdust sticking out from, from your tree. That has a special name, but I can't remember it right now. Yeah, unfortunately, it's, I don't think there's a lot, there's really not much you can do once you have ambrosia beetles going after your tree. I think it's basically your, you should be expecting your trees to be slowly declining after that and planning to have your tree removed. And depending on how close your tree is to a structure or your neighbor's property, making it the best decision that you can for hiring a reliable tree care company to to remove the, that tree in the safest way possible. There are in some insecticide treatments that can be used for ambrosia beetles, but that's basically kind of, it's more of delaying than inevitable at that point. 
Senator Sarville, Delegate Kryzik, how, how else can we uh, top off the night tonight? I, I think you guys have done a great job and there's no magic bullet. I think we all realize that. And we've learned a lot tonight about tree care, especially about the oaks. The big message here, I think, is not to give up on our oak trees. And then there's some, some other smaller takeaways, but that how important our tree canopy is and how much stress it has had. And sometimes we forget, you know, that walking underneath them is not always the best thing too. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, change some of my uh, habits around my garden and save some of my older trees that I'm concerned about. But thank you everybody. I, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it to my colleagues to uh, close it out. I just, I'm just impressed with our community and, and how much, uh, I really, we're a community of tree huggers and I think we all should be proud of that. And that's one of the reasons we all live here is because of our trees. And we, you know, so many of our streets are named like mine, White Oaks Drive, named after trees. And we, we've got to do all we can to save them and, and to keep, and there's so much value that we have, we all take for granted from our trees. A lot of it's just psychological value, you know, that it makes us feel better. So thank you very much. Yeah, Paul, and, and like you, Paul didn't say this, but he, he lives in the house he grew up in, or one of the houses he grew up in, and I live in the house two doors down from the house I grew up in, in my grandparents' house, and the reason I came, one of the reasons I came back to my neighborhood is because I grew up in the woods. My, my grandparents built this house in 1941 with 19 other families. It was one of the first subdivisions in the county, and they deliberately chose to build their community in a neighborhood that was in the woods and not on open farm fields, which Fairfax County had 40,000 people back then. And the trees are very important to me. They're important to my neighbors. That's why people move to my neighborhood. They drive around, they see the trees. They say, that's the house I want to buy. And we want to do all we can to preserve what we've got here, notwithstanding what's going on with climate change and in our environment and everything. And I think the information you all provided is helpful. I also think that it's important that everybody who's on understand that your state and local governments have resources available to you to help you save the tree canopy that you have. I'm not sure a lot of people understand that the Fairfax County has a tree office or that Virginia has an urban forester that can come and look at your property and give you advice or help, or there's government resources available to give you advice about, about steps you can take to help preserve your tree canopy. So I'm, I'm hoping that with the meeting we had tonight, a lot of people realize there's a lot of resources out there that their taxes help to fund that can help them preserve the tree canopy they have. And one, one last little plug I just want to give is that if you like trees and you also want to do something about solar, we have community solar coming soon, which means you can actually buy solar energy for your house from somebody else. So you don't have to put cut down the trees to get solar panels on your roof. There's going to be ways that our General Assembly has passed where you can participate in the solar power economy without cutting your trees down. And so that's coming, coming soon, but it, it's not impossible to have solar power and trees in your yard. So don't, don't think you have to cut all your trees down if you want to have panels on your roof. There's, there's a way to do it. So, but that's what I have to say. And I guess, uh, Dan, you're, you're last. Supervisor Stork, uh, why don't you take us away here? Finish this out. I'd be happy to. And I, again, I want to thank Scott for raising the issue and, and Supervisor Sir Senator Sovell, as well as Delegate Krizek for all their work in our community. And I know you have, with the three of us, three deeply committed environmental and naturally focused individuals, because we have so much of that in our community, you know, between our two rivers and, and our like eight or 10, like eight creeks in the area and just so many other levels. The county is here to provide those kinds of supports. I know we have the extension service you know, the soil model conservation, we have lots of resources here. And so what I'm saying, if, if nothing else, everybody, if in doubt, you know, you're more than welcome to email my office anytime, which I just put our email address in the chat. It's just M-T-V-E-R-N-O-N, that's Mount Vernon at fairfaxcounty.gov. Um, anytime we have folks that we can connect you with, um, if you want us to, to put together something, we're happy to coordinate this much like we did the, the presentation tonight. I also have an environmental advisory committee which gets together. They represent all the different individuals who represent uh, you, Mount Vernon District, on our different committees, whether it's an environmental quality advisory council, what we call EQAC, or our tree, tree commission, or wetlands board, Chesapeake uh, Bay. Again, we have a number of different institutions and boards that, that are 
residents sit on that are very involved in making sure that, that we do in fact uh, have a world that we can be proud of and frankly can pass on to our children and children's children. So again, thank you all for being part of the, the presentation, making the difference for our community as well as really having doing something I think we all learned a lot. So appreciate it. You'll have a good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. At anything else before we close out tonight, Joanne? Oh, yes, actually, this thing behind me. So if anyone happens to see this thing. The spotted lantern fly. Yes, yeah, spotted lantern fly. Uh, we're on the lookout for it. So if you happen to see it, contact my office. You can report it on report slf at fairfaxcounty.gov. We've been looking for this invasive pest throughout the county this year and have many traps around the county. Thank you, everybody. Good night.